Christian Bogdanovich, it's so awesome to have you here and be able to ask you some questions. I think you are now something of a, a really uh, a standard name in, in the cla modern classical guitar repertoire. Your contribution is enormous. You've written so many works, sonatas, mm -hmm. uh, concertos, um, oh, pieces, yeah. and also you've published a lot of books about composition, mm -hmm. about arranging, about harmony. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is um, incredible, I think. And, and uh, also this type of, the fact that you've written books for uh, composers too, I mean, that meant a lot to me, for example, I think okay. that's generous Thanks. that Thanks. you're sharing that. Thanks. I know, but so I actually, to, to be honest with you, I don't even, wouldn't even know where to begin. But I know that you've been uh, working on these preludes, uh, yeah. which are kind of, would you like to tell us some more about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I can, I can tell you everything about it. <laughs> so Great. The, the idea for the preludes was uh, to write some spontaneous little pieces that were equivalent to Japanese haiku poetry. So the idea is to have something short and concentrated and to make it kind of different every day. So as the day goes, every day is a little bit different. And so um, there is an incredible amount of variety in the, these preludes. And I also used some of the poetry, uh, the Japanese poetry uh, by, you know, some of the great Japanese poets like uh, Basho, Isa, Shiki, etc. So, so I really wanted to kind of do it in seasons. So this, these are seasonal preludes. And so what I did was uh, I actually wrote maybe like three years ago, maybe three years ago, I wrote uh, uh, three uh, seasons, that is to say the springtime, uh, summer and the autumn and then in the winter it just got too cold <laughs> and so I had to stop. <laughs> so I just didn't do anything uh, for these three years and then this year uh, Angelo Marchese, uh, uh, who is really an excellent uh, Italian guitarist, uh, he asked me if he can do the preludes and so I thought okay good opportunity to do the winter preludes and so I finally wrote the winter preludes and now he is working very hard on these preludes and it will come out on Brilliant Classics, which oh. is, yeah, it's a very nice record label, which is yeah. just where you are. They are there exactly, because the preludes, a lot of times we talk about 24, but I guess you're not doing the, um, are you doing the sort of... I'm doing 12 preludes, 12 preludes, 12 preludes. season. So there are 48 preludes, 48 preludes. So it's kind of... Um, you have 48 preludes. I have 48 preludes. Wow, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I like to compose, so, you know. Well, you're talking about the seasons. I, I, this is personal, but I, this thing sure. about 24 keys, now you maybe not, or, sorry, did, were you doing them in all different keys or are you ignoring that? You just follow the numbers. I'm ignoring that. No, I mean, right? I, don't, I don't really, I don't necessarily write in keys anyway. Right. I mean, but still, you're keeping the oh. numbers because it's interesting. We have the 24 preludes, and you know, we have the 24 hours in the day, but you also have the 12 months. <laughs> so it is quite easy, in, like in, okay. in your case, right? Mathematically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, no, I think you're right. A year. I just can't. Yes, stop yes, that. <laughs> yes. It just seemed the right number, and um, you know. Uh, I mean, often people do six preludes, like say Villa Lobos. You know, right. he wrote. But he wrote five, so nobody was able to find the sixth one. <laughs> but, you know, some, 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 yeah, you know, but some composers write a lot of preludes, like say Scriabin wrote many, many preludes and then the Debussy. So Debussy has been perhaps my, if there is like a role model, you know, I mean, he has been a, a perhaps one biggest influence for me with this preludes. And, and Debussy has been my first sort of my first love in music anyway, you mm -hmm. know, when I was, uh, yeah, when I was young, you know, I mean, first I, I kind of, I liked the Beatles and, and the rock and I played the electric guitar. So that was my first influence. But then after that, the BC was probably uh, wow. the second. So, so there are these incredible, beautiful, uh, you know, Pas sur la neige, uh, all kinds of like beautiful um, Debussy preludes that I grew up with, so. 
Anyway. I have actually here to, so there are basically 12 preludes per season. Okay. Correct? Okay, we're back to the 12. Okay, yeah. We're back. 12 preludes per season. Also, that's fine. That's fine. No, uh -huh. but I, I really like it because, of course, you have Vivaldi, of course, is very famous for his four seasons, but... Yeah, Vivaldi wasn't my model in this <laughs> no, case. No, no, but <laughs> it's a very... No, nothing wrong with Vivaldi, but, you know, yeah, sure. It's a powerful sure. analogy to compare music because also... When we're yeah. talking about the sweet, uh -huh. like a sweet, but right. movement, it's it's a process, like so. It's kind of similar to a year, you know, and the spring comes, summer, you know, right? So I, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, it, it's sort of. I was looking for something that comes very naturally, and <laughs> so it seemed to me like, actually, this wasn't a commission. Nobody commissioned me to do this. I kind of commissioned myself, you know. <laughs> I just I just decided it was just a fun thing to do something very kind of a purposeless if you will you know purposeless. of course it's not purposeless but you understand what I mean yeah I see exactly what I mean and and it's beautiful mm -hmm. but like start to get more in detail about that but would you say then for example is the winter preludes is are they say yeah. more cold and frozen and are the or is is it bigger than that or or I, I think they're a little bit colder. <laughs> I think they're a bit colder. <laughs> the winter ones are because, a little bit, maybe. Yes, maybe. I'm sorry to say, but I'm very influenced by the climate, you know. Yeah. So as soon yeah. as the sun shows up, I kind of tend to cheer up. And so my and so music the tends to are a little bit that way too. Or do, if we hear these 48 prelates, would we feel very <laughs> right. clearly the summer, the spring, the winter? I'm not sure that you could, uh, because nevertheless, I mean, there is a variety of moods, there is a variety of uh, different atmospheres. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's unlikely, because that would mean that I'm so influenced by the climate mm -hmm. that all of my winter music is going to be kind of gloomy or uh, cold, <laughs> like you say. <laughs> and, and all... But there is maybe a general feeling. There's more of a, a, a slower feeling to it. And some of my summer are perhaps, I don't know, maybe they're, uh, um, maybe they are kind of more sunny and there's mm. more light, uh, perhaps. I'm not sure. I haven't really thought about that, but um, well, now I'm we'll leave it maybe for the future. It, we'll leave it here. Hear it. And I'm really looking yeah. forward to that. Actually, that is excellent that you will put that in an entire album. Um, yeah. And I'm happy about that. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward, and I'm sure that it will be a very big sort of contribution to the repertoire. And that's maybe where I would like to pick up from now to, to talk a little bit about, um, mm -hmm. because, I mean, I'm a writer too, obviously you've been around for right. a long time, and uh, there's a kind of slowness, like, you, you, like now you're producing these preludes, it might take some years, 10, 20 years before people start right. to kind of recognize that and um, and in your case I mean it might sound a bit harsh but for a lot of composers you can it seems like a lot of people have some kind of hits so I mean obviously yeah. in your case we have mysterious habitants right that's just been played habitants. Habitants. sorry habitants <laughs> sorry. Yeah, they're, they're not that the but it I mean it's just it's played a lot I think in, in, I know you are right. You're there's right. a lot of it. another one, of course, which I remember being really first time I heard that I was really blown away. Of course, it's the Balkan uh, miniatures. Yeah, I know. I know these are my hits. Oh, sorry, yeah, you're right. You. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, well this is not. I mean, mm, go ahead. No, no. I'm. Just, I just find it interesting yeah. how it's some is for some composers well, like those pieces. Okay. Of but of course, there's so much more and. And probably with time. I would hope so. Yeah, I would hope so. You know what? I mean, the, the thing about this kind of stuff is, you know, I actually wrote somewhere. I was uh, somebody was doing an interview with me, and I said, "Well, how would you feel? No comparison with me, but just comparison with the situation. How would you feel if everything you knew about Beethoven was Furelise, <laughs> <laughs> or if all you knew about Bach?" was the aria on G string. You know what I mean? Yes. Then yeah. he would say, yeah, that's great music. That's pretty nice. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else can you say? But you haven't heard the nine symphonies of Beethoven. Yeah. You haven't heard the mess in B minor, etc. So that's the problem with these things, you know, with these hits. Like you get these hits, and then suddenly people are pigeonholed into um, mm -hmm. into something. You know, it's kind of like as if your whole life is suddenly right. narrowed down. You know, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I know. So yeah, sure. You know, but usually these hits are. Kind yeah. of, you know, there are things that didn't require necessarily some kind of tremendous amount of work. You know, I wrote Mysterious Habit that Habit that's in one afternoon. You know, I mean, oh, really? Like, well, that's of what course. I was... I mean, big deal, you know. No, yeah. I mean, it's well, it's simple, but it's also pretty, uh, how to say, I mean, it's transcendent a little bit. You hear it and right immediately you, you're gonna get yeah. put into this other world and you have this. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's a masterpiece, to be honest, but I understand oh. that you feel that maybe that's over representative of you. <laughs> Thank but, you very much. <laughs> but if you don't mind, we could, because I mean, a lot of people yeah. love this piece. Um, a lot Mine. of people play it. Maybe it's also because it's one of your pieces that is not as difficult to play, but it got to be more than that. It's obviously something about this music that really speaks to people. Yeah. So yeah, you, I know maybe you uh -huh. talked about it a hundred times, but what's with this piece and what makes it so special apart from that you wrote it in an afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing really that special about it, to tell you the truth. What you it is, a lot of people out there disappointed, you know, people. Are yeah, like, well, you yeah. know, I'm sorry about that. But, uh, you know, okay, the, what is perhaps interesting about it is that it's in five. So the, me the metric is already a bit different. It's in five. Uh, it's got an interlocked sort of uh, lines. There are two interlocked lines. And in that sense, it, it has some reference to Barricade Mysterieuse, you know, so oh. that was actually the original. Oh. That's why it's called the Mysterious Habitats. It's after the, the Mysterious Barricades. Okay, so Mysterious Barricades is similarly interlocked. They're like rhythmically and melodically interlocked parts. So that's really what, what in this piece is interesting, but it, it is in five. So that's kind of what makes it uh, more interesting. Otherwise it's kind of like a, it's like, like a rock song really, like mm -hmm. could have been written by Sting or uh, somebody. <laughs> you know? Oh. Yeah, and that's why I think people like it, you know, because it's it's kind of accessible, it's very open, and it has uh, perhaps an atmosphere of kind of like you say, transcendence. I don't know if I would say transcendence, but you know, if you history, want there's to be something there. I think because of your polyrhythms, it has some right. kind of effect on the human psyche. I think to put us well, in a very so, I mean, it is extremely, it. sometimes it's like that, right? Some of the most brilliant things were sort of almost made just by coincidence and whether yeah. you say it's not special or not, you say Sting could have written it, but I think probably only you could have written it. And although you did it in the afternoon, it's obviously kind right. of it's spilling over your entire life and experience. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. I, I, I just <laughs> came up with the theory of relativity just one afternoon in Basel. <laughs> Right. There you go. But okay, so we will leave that. Don't worry. But I know a lot okay. of people love that piece. And of course, but at the same time, it is important to have these kind of pieces where you're getting to know a composer at first. And and then, of mm -hmm. course, in your case, there's so much more to, to dwell into. But of course, let's but let's also mention a little bit about Balkan miniatures. This is I mean, of course, you speak also from 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 your heritage in a way. Yeah, uh, but it's, I mean, again, it's just, it, these movements are short, but they're haunting. They have also that kind of, it's really immediate. And I think it's the, one of those pieces that a lot of people feel like, wow, what was that? You know, mm -hmm. like you start and 10, 12 minutes late, it's almost like you didn't even like, where did, what was that? You know, it's very, it, it keeps you very. Your attention is very heightened, I feel, when you, when you hear a piece like that. Well, thank you very much. I mean, you're very kind, you know, and, and it's very nice you're saying this stuff. <laughs> uh, it was just another afternoon. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint them. No, actually, I originally wrote only three miniatures. 
And I wrote these miniatures for a soundboard magazine. There used to be a magazine called Soundboard Magazine. And they needed some pieces that were kind of not too difficult. Oh. So, <laughs> so that was that's another reason for the success of the piece, is that they're not that difficult, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And then Bill Kanengeiser <clears throat> came over once I was living in San Francisco. And Bill just came over, uh, you know, just for a visit. And we kind of were hanging out a bit. And then he said, well, do you have any sort of ethnic kind of like Balkan pieces? And so then I thought, I mean, I had all kinds of very complicated, uh, uh, sort of difficult and mysterious things. And then I showed him this. I said, well, I wrote these for the soundboard. He said, oh, great. These are perfect. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. So then I added another three. And then it seemed like uh, it somehow corresponded at that time to the breakup of Yugoslavia, you know? So I actually dedicated the piece, then I dedicated the piece uh, to the world peace, mm -hmm. thinking primarily about my own country, how it was, uh, how Yugoslavia, how it was destroyed and, and actually the six republics. That's why it's like six pieces, six right. miniatures. They, they were kind of like miniatures, you know, like six little republics that belong to Yugoslavia. They they broke up at the at the same time, but for me it was more kind of like putting it back together. <laughs> oh, I, I put them back together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because I felt like the Balkan um, sort of folk music and the language is actually, how shall I say, it's very unique. Uh, it's very unique, and it is actually, it, it is a unifying language in a way for that whole region. So, in, yeah, you know, so that's that's why, you know, they're also Balkan. I mean, they could have been uh, Yugoslavian or uh, Serbian or Macedonian or something, but they're not, you know. So that that was my idea for that. And I thought um, I thought of doing that. Fascinating. And so that also shows that in this case, Bill, and this is yep. a whole other very interesting subject about your, your life and career that you live sometime in America and so on. Yep. But sure. so in this case, Bill, a particular guitarist, was actually quite important in, in this. Yes, yes. Would you say, are there other colleagues or other guitarists in that sense that have been very important for you? Yeah. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, I actually even played the piece for Segovia, <laughs> you know, while he was still alive. That's yeah. right. That's amazing. Do you have a picture? It was in 85. It was in 85. I wrote variations on a studio in Luz. You probably know. That's yes, one of by Segovia, yeah. Exactly. One of his rare oh, pieces. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. So, you know, of course, I mean, he was already, uh, you know, really old and everything. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's 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 a great thing to have a, a you know, like an excellent or a great guitarist play your music. And I mean, what that's did he say? What was he? Did he enjoy the fact that you wrote? Uh, well, very... it was. It was very short. It wasn't no. really. No, no. It wasn't very memorable. It wasn't did memorable. You get <laughs> did you get the picture? That's the question. Yeah. No. 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 I was. Uh, yeah. I know. I know. I know. A selfie with Segovia. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. Those were not those. Those were not those days. No, not those were not days. those days. Hire a photographer. Oh, yeah. An amazing story, actually. Yeah. Do but you then, by any chance still have, is that, what did that turn into, that uh, variations on uh, Parliament? Mm, Parliament. Seen loose. Nothing really, I mean, it's just a piece, it's sitting there somewhere, and uh, I mean, it's Producción Dos, uh, Doberman. It's published, right? Yeah, yeah, it's out. published, sure, sure. I That's like this fantastic. piece. Yeah. Well, we, so, I mean, it, you have so many pieces, <laughs> I wouldn't, in a way, we talk now about, but I mean, I just want to mention another piece which is quite particular which is the uh introduction pasacalia and fugue for the golden flower oh yeah yeah uh, i mean this is something very um i never really seen a piece like that and mm -hmm. and and drawing up also upon this this sort of this is a so I understand it's a kind of some kind of buddhist uh, uh, philosophy and literature that is somehow incorporated almost like some kind of well you can tell us yeah, yeah i can i, I can yeah. tell you about it. well before we do that i just wanted to mention very shortly, very mm -hmm. shortly yes. about because you 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 touched upon this uh 
if other guitarists have played my music. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention a yes. few other people and then we can go, then we can go. So anyway, I would mention that Zoran Dukic, yeah. certainly, you mm -hmm. know, he's done a lot for me and he, he premiered. Uh, uh, a lot of people today know the Balkan miniatures. I think a lot of them yeah. know it's from Zoran. Yes, it's true. You're it absolutely all over right. the world. You are absolutely right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely right. Then the LA Guitar Quartet, uh, Bill Kanengeiser, mm -hmm. Then more recently, Edin Karamazov, who I, I don't really know if you're very familiar. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So Edin, who is a great friend of mine and, and uh, you know, great musician too, great mm -hmm. artist. Anyway, we've done some work together. Mm -hmm. We did actually a kind of recomposing of Sting's, uh, some of Sting's hits, which, oh, cool. which I kind of, yeah, yeah, which I called Prisms. Prisms, but they're like these famous, uh, like, uh, you know, like a message in a bottle, mm. like Roxanne and things like that. Mm. Oh, nice. So, yeah, so that was, that was great. It was actually very enjoyable for me. I, I totally enjoyed this. Mm -hmm. And it was written, it is still written. It's written for guitar and string quartet. Oh. So, yeah, and Edin actually put out the record and kind of, uh, you know, called it sort of reminiscence. Mm -hmm. So he put the Leo Brower's uh, Beatles arrangements mm -hmm. and on the other side, no, not the other side. The other side. Uh, LP. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say on the other side. Did he make LP still? No, he didn't make. Oh, yeah, actually, he did make LP. No, 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 he did make LP. Oh, okay, that's why. Yes, he actually did make LP. And the other side was with uh, with Sting. Um, oh, cool. So I just wanted to mention that I've been working no, with I, him I, and this is really yeah. Uh, and, writing for lute also because he's a lutist. Um, have David, you? Yeah, David Tannenbaum. Yeah. Lots of different people I've, I've worked with. Um, oh. So. So I would like to talk a little okay. bit more of a little bit about this piece, Introduction, Casacalia yeah. and Fugue for the Golden Flower. Yeah. And maybe we can start with what is the Golden Flower? I also see it's written okay. in 1985. So it's already, again, some time back. <laughs> right, right. It's, uh, yeah, it's in my prehistory. <laughs> you know, 85 is a really long time ago. It's true. Well, um, what did I do in 85? I was living in two places at the same time. I was living in, I had an apartment in Santa Monica in California. And I had a job at the Academy of Belgrade in Yugoslavia. So I decided I was going to try living at two places at the same time. And so I would live like three months in one, four months in another, three months, etc. So that was my idea at that point. Um, and at that point, I was perhaps not now as much, but I was very much influenced by uh, by these two philosophies, by Taoism and Buddhism. So they're like a, uh, two things that have been following me through, throughout my whole life, really. And uh, actually, come to think of it, I mean, also my uh, uh, my preludes, you know, they're kind of like, in a way, it's it's kind of like, uh, you know, after the, the, the Zen philosophy, and, uh, you know, that's why the haiku also kind of works very, very well with it. Um, the golden flower is, uh, it's, it's like a meditation, it's a Taoist meditation. And so they're like sort of instructions how to meditate and how to sort of uh, crystallize your spirit in a way and, and how to find um, um, a very natural and spontaneous way of developing. So that's my interpretation. Okay, that's my interpretation. I'm sure that, you know, pe people could, could say all kinds of stuff and, and correct me in that. But anyway, that's, that's what it meant for me. So I was actually trying with this piece to have a completely spontaneous development where I would kind of, my, my personal, uh, how shall I say, my personal self would have very little influence. I was more kind of like, I mean, I usually try to do that anyway, you know. I just let the thing develop by itself. Let's put it that way. So the thing develops by itself uh, in a very spontaneous and kind of natural way. And I try to kind of interfere as little as possible. Mm. Okay, so... Uh, of course, I'm there like some kind of a midwife, so to say. I mean, like you're giving a birth to a musical baby. I'm more like a midwife. I'm kind of helping, you know, how are we going to get this baby out, you know, to the left, to the right. But I'm not really, I was trying not to be really the, the main mover in this. And um, 
so so this is really the the the, the philosophy behind this piece you know mm. however however um I started with something different. I had a different uh, one Indian scale, like a Bhairava, Bhairava uh, Raga, uh, and I sort of started with that. But then I wrote it for maybe two days, and then I just decided that wasn't right. Mm. It just wasn't right. It was very interesting. It was interesting, but I thought it didn't follow this idea that I had of doing something very spontaneous, and it was becoming, how shall I say, too much of an intellectual construction. Mm -hmm. So then I came back, I said, okay, let's just throw this away, mm -hmm. which is kind of sad, but you have to do that with music. You know, you just throw it away, you know, it just throw it away. And then I came back to the piece and I had this different beginning, which just sort of happened so spontaneously, so mm -hmm. nicely that then I just continued, you know? So it's really like a, uh, like a growing meditation, I, I would say this piece. Mm. And, uh, and actually something comes to my mind, um, uh, you know, Morton Feldman, the composer Morton mm -hmm. Feldman, contemporary music. Anyway, uh, he says something very interesting. He's actually a great writer. I'm not as much fan of his music, but I think his writings are incredible. But he says this in composition. It's like, you just go along a road and then like in Ireland, I mean, I haven't been in Ireland, but that's his example. He says, in Ireland, they say, then you see a church on the left, ignore it. Ah. <laughs> then you continue, you see a beautiful meadow on the, on the right, ignore it. <laughs> so that's, so the point is don't get, don't get infatuated with what's happening. Mm. You just have your, you follow your direction and you don't get kind of like, uh, you know, infatuated with any beautiful little thing you do, mm -hmm. because that's not really the essential movement of the piece. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it, it, very interesting. I think like a, like a great, great point. I always like that. I, I mentioned that sometimes to my students in composition, mm -hmm. because we all get kind of, we get attracted by wonderful things that happen, you know. But if that's not really natural way of the piece to develop, we should ignore it, you know, just uh, so anyway. So I ignored that first interesting intellectual construction of the piece and I came back to the spontaneous natural law. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the piece. That's, that's... Yes, I can really feel that in this piece, this kind of uh, unfolding, let's say. Yeah, but, unfolding uh... is, that, that's exactly how I would call it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I mean, particularly in, perhaps in the Pasacalia also, you, it's kind yeah, of like, yeah. it's uh, it's a kind of a piece that you can almost you can go along with the Bach Chacon kind of. <laughs> That's it is, it's, it's a very well, cool kind of, no. yeah. uh, I, I mean, there is actually Pasacalia, the only Pasacalia that Bach wrote for organ in C minor. Mm. And, and that. Yeah, interestingly enough, now that you mentioned the Pasakaya, that's actually why I decided to be a musician. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. So it's actually after listening to this Pasakaya in C minor uh, mm -hmm. for organ. So it's not guitar music. The, the mm -hmm. guitar music didn't really get me to go into, into it. But uh, I was so kind of blown away by this piece. I was so uh, touched and amazed that I just thought, well, it's really worth spending your time and your life on this kind of stuff wow yeah 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 and then maybe we could, is that i heard some kind of stories about you that uh, you you were actually pursuing some kind of other career originally and then you chose music at some point in your life is that true or? well yeah yeah well i mean you know yeah to some extent it's true i mean i actually painted i, I was i was very much involved in painting so i mean i did lots of uh ink drawings and then I also started doing some uh, oils you know oil paintings so I mean I see your Vermeer there behind you yes. you know, that man, oh, right this is, uh, you know a, a not I know you know, obviously it's, it, no, I, it's quite funny because I came back to Netherlands and then it was oh. there you know because I rented furnished and then I was like well welcome <laughs> you're in the Netherlands you're in the Netherlands 
so anyway, yeah, I, I kind of really, uh, I, I just loved painting and I, I still, uh, you know, I go sometimes to galleries to look at uh, whatever, contemporary art or Renaissance or whatever. And I'm just so kind of um, thrilled, you know, mm. to look at the paintings. Mm. Uh, you know, another interesting thing, maybe, maybe this is meaningful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you kind of, you look at the details and the kind of work with patience and incredible patience, you know, that these people have. I mean, sure, you know, people in music have also patience, but I don't think they have as much patience <laughs> as the painter. Right. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, it inspires me to look at, for example, the Dutch painters. I love Dutch painters. You know, you look at Vermeer or you look at Peter de Hoog and, you know, some really great painters. I love looking at these, uh, you know, Rembrandt, you know, of course, you know, and you look at these details and this kind of uh, patience, mm. you know, patience. I think it's incredibly important to be patient and, and, and not to think like uh, it's just all kind of like one big mumbo jumbo and let's do it as quickly as possible and get done with it and goodbye, see you later, you know. I don't think that's what it is, you know. I think it's we are a bit tempted to do that these days, especially, you know, because everything is so fast, you know, you have the internet, uh, you press one button, there, there is one site, you press another button, there's a concert, you press another button, you know what I mean? And I think that there is an example, a great example of patience and kind of, how shall I say, respect to time, mm -hmm. and respect to, 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 to just, value you know something that that you really respect ah. you know you know what i mean well so I anyway. think, but in a way also to you okay we live in a society like you say it's very exaggerated in terms of media and yeah, you know, there's I think so, so much we can access right. but at the same time because there's so much put out there i think for a lot of people for a lot of uh, creative people it will only be a few things that will be truly known known you know, yeah, only, that's probably true. In a sense, we can also think of it absolutely opposite that because it's such a mess today, we need to really put a lot of patience into something very short yeah. because that's what you're gonna. So, well, maybe that's true too. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I, it's I, a kind of it's it, it's a yeah. complex time, but um, yeah, but it is an interesting time in terms of the way we can mm -hmm. access information, and in a way, I feel you are. This kind of person that already did this before way before the internet and so, so in a way you're really at least for me really kind of mm -hmm. a great inspiration and uh, and you kind of walk that path and because thanks what, when you started doing that obviously it wasn't like you just went on youtube no. and was listening to raga by blah blah, blah. No, you, no i guess you had to go to the library no, 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 no. or no, no. i don't know how you got hold right. of all your materials Okay, no, it's very interesting. This is very interesting. Maybe just to, to wind down that uh, painting that, you know, it yes, was a great yes. thing to do. But then once I get involved with music, I just couldn't stop. Mm. Yeah, music is kind of like, a, it's like a infectious disease. <laughs> you know, music <laughs> is a disease. Yeah. You know, yeah, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's such an incredible thing. It's social. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's got so many aspects of it that are just really incredible. So anyway, I just wanted to mention oh, that. Yeah. So yeah, so at some point I just had to stop with that. Yeah, uh, I'm still wait, very curious what it was like for you in those right. days to access all this information about okay. music. Right. Like, at that right. time it wasn't so easy, right? Well, it was more difficult in some ways, you know, it was more difficult. Um, uh, well, you know, I studied both guitar and composition. Mm -hmm. I studied both. But at, uh, when I was younger, then I had to do these competitions. And I mean, like you did too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. And, uh, you know, I felt it was really necessary to do it. And I mean, I guess it's good for your career to have some kind of a stamp of societal approval, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's not yeah. a bad thing, right? But then at some point I started feeling kind of more and more interested in composition, improvisation showed up uh, much more. And so uh, I was at, at that time, I mean, I don't know what's your compositional um, journey, but 
when I was studying, you know, what was really uh, uh, very popular in the contemporary music was uh, the avant-garde music of mm -hmm. the 70s. And, uh, you know, so it was Darmstadt mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and Irkam, you know, Sankha Pompidou. Irkam, so anyway, Paris. so there were, yeah, these great examples of Ligeti, Stockhausen, and, um, and the Boulez, et cetera. So I followed that at that point. Mm. I did, I did. I was writing serial music and lots of things like that. And then at some point, I just had a kind of like a like a divorce. <laughs> I had a divorce with that with that sort of music. And so uh, you know, then I discovered that there were other potential uh, mm. examples. So I started listening to more to Indian music. I listened to uh, pygmies. I discovered pygmies, right. for example. Yeah, um, there was this. Uh, a recording uh, by by Radio France uh, of Bibayak pygmies is a particular mm. tribe. I mean, I think they live in Gabon. In Gabon, so I was just amazed when I heard this. Um, you know, this pygmy. And still, pygmies are kind of like uh, pygmy music is like something I greatly admire. Mm. You know, because there's uh, if you listen to their vocal polyphony. It's incredible, you know, these interlocked melodies, they're, they're repetitive, but you know, it, it's got an awesome complexity and it's very, very interesting. And maybe I should mention also that I, I brought uh, to Geneva, maybe six, seven years ago, uh, this great ethnomusicologist, Simha Aram. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Anyway, he wrote this uh, great book, which, which I have somewhere here called African Polyphony and Polyrhythm. Oh yeah, it's like a Bible. I book. Yes, I do. it's a it's a Bible. I, yes, it's a Bible I, of African yeah, music. It's very thick. It's very thick, and it costs a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, like uh, yeah, like it's really cost like hundreds of dollars. Yeah, yeah, it was like hundred sixty, yeah. like hundred seventy dollars. I was very, I thought, God, you know, I mean, I'm spending so much money on that book. <laughs> like, you know, it's just an incredible, wonderful book. And so, anyway, I actually managed to get him. Um, you know, I think he still lives in Paris. He was the the, the director of this ethnomusicological center in Paris. I invited him to come to Geneva. So he came to Geneva, like I say, five, six years ago. And he did a whole week of uh, lectures and demonstrations wow. of the pygmy music. Fantastic. And that's, yeah, it was, it was incredible. You know, I was just so thrilled to have him uh, here talk about it. And, uh, you know, so everybody was very kind of interested. And I mean, he spent 20 years in uh, Central African Republic, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of recording, working with uh, pygmies, and mm -hmm. I think Aka, Aka pygmies primarily, but various other uh, uh, tribes. So anyway, so I've been connected with this, uh, you know, different kinds of ethnic music. And when I was in, in San Francisco, I, I went a bit to the Ali, Ali Akbar Khan yeah. Institute. There is an Ali Akbar Khan Institute. And, and I was interested in uh, playing a bit with uh, Indian musicians. So I played a bit, you know, but uh, there was somebody who played sitar, Mm -hmm. So I had great interest in that too. And then at some point I came back to Balkan music. Ah. Yeah, so to, 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 to say honestly, I detested Balkan music. <laughs> <laughs> when I was growing up, it was like, uh, it was everywhere. It was, right. like, it was everywhere. It, it was just horrible. I couldn't stand it, you know. <laughs> Because, you know, I, I was interested in classical music. I was interested sure, no, I in jazz and, you know. But then with the distance, you know, with the distance and living in the United States, I kind of started re-listening to this stuff. And, and for example, I wrote this about Balkan miniatures. And there are many other things that are uh, influenced by uh, mm -hmm. Balkan folk music and modes. And uh, um, so that's something I think that's kind of, that's pretty interesting. So these are primarily my influences. Sure, I like tube and throat uh, singing, you know, but, you know, it's not something uh, that I can sort of <laughs> experiment with. So there are certain kinds of music that you feel close to. Mm -hmm. and I felt, I guess, primarily, uh, of talking of ethnic music, I felt primarily Near Eastern Balkan music. Mm -hmm. I was very kind of, and then, India to some extent, but you know, Indian music is just like so complex. Right. Tell me it's about just it. like, you know, you can't just uh, sort of go on vacation to Indian music. You know, <laughs> the people dedicate their whole lives, you know, to just studying the, the rhythms and, and stuff like that. So, 
I have a great respect uh, and, but you know, one thing I would mention is that I never really imitated any of these musics. I was more kind of, I wanted to use certain elements that were kind of inspiring for me. Mm -hmm. uh, like for example, the Pasacalla, the introduction is more typical of say some kind of a Balkan kind of type of improvisation. It's not so much Indian, but the Pasacalla is very much a, like, like Indian music, but I used it in the context of a Western form. I used it in the context of a Pasacalla. So I actually have done a lot of this synthesizing. It's kind of like synthesizing languages. And so much of my music goes through say like Richard Carr forms, mm -hmm. because that's something that I studied a lot, the Richard Carr forms. And so uh, those kinds of forms I've used more than anything else, you know. So or that's a type of uh, uh, variation form, or I think a lot of Richard Carr. No, it's really a precedent. It, it's sort of like a like 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 an um, predecessor predecessor to fugue. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. It's a predecessor to fugue. It's kind of you know fantasia form or Richard Carr. You know, it's they were interchangeable terms. Right. However, Richard Carr is more kind of it's 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 a more intuitively developed. Uh, he's got more improvisation, and so for me, Richard Carr sort of fits in a bit better because it's improvisational style. I like fugues too. I mean, you know, how can you not like fugues? But it's a bit too strict a fugue for my personality. I yeah, I find fugue a little bit too strict. But I've written many fugues too. Yeah, the fugue is also kind of pushing the guitar now. Of course, it is a polyphonic yeah. instrument, but right. we're hitting into some, you know, dead ends there also. With <laughs> yeah. Fugue. But saying that, of course, your music is truly, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is it is polyphonic. It's very really polyphonic. Yeah. yeah. So that is a strong yeah. element there. And the guitar truly is a polyphonic instrument, right? I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah, guitar is... He, it's a string instrument that's actually capable of polyphony. I mean, you know, who else can really do like a really decent polyphony? I mean, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, yeah, and I've done studies and, and like this book that I wrote about counterpoint in three voices. I think three voices is good enough for guitar. I don't think, I mean, two voices is very clear. Three voices, a little more obscure, but you can still do three voices. I don't think four voices means very much in, in guitar. Mm -hmm. And if you look like, uh, you know, say like uh, the Milano Fantasias, mm -hmm. that's pretty much, I think, three voices, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, sure, with Bach, you know, we have sometimes like uh, some very, uh, you know, complex polyphony. But I would think that's why I, I stuck to three voices. That's why my counterpoint is for three voices. And it's actually based on Renaissance counterpoint. So it's after Palestrina. All right. Yeah. Well, that is awesome. I mean, this is also the other aspect of, of, of you, right. which is this kind of educator and also like just sharing. And um, yeah. I mean, I really liked your book, which was a little more philosophical. Hmm. And it's just slipped out of my mind, but it's something like per. It was something for Exo 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 Exo, which is also Exo one yes. of your pieces. Yes. Yes, it's one of my pieces. This was That's a little right. bit more maybe philosophical, but I just yeah, it was. It is uh, great that somebody just did that. You know. <laughs> well, and you know. talked about these things and yeah, you know, because we we the. Um, this is the kind of when you share in that way, put it down in that way, it's become sort of like a statement. And I think it means something. And in a sense, maybe we need more of that in the guitar world. Yeah. Uh, well, I would hope so. I would hope so. You know, I mean, guitarists are, I mean, I'm sorry to say, but guitarists aren't always, they're not always great thinkers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, guitarists really like to play guitar, you know, they, so they're in love with the instrument, they're in love with the strings, with the music, they're in love with success and being in front of the public and all that. So, you know, that's just the nature of it, you know, it's the nature. Right. But, but I think that it is really lacking, in my opinion, it's lacking some perspective on, on uh, you know, on, on, on aesthetics, on philosophy, music, etc., you know. 
And there are some people that have done uh, like Angelo Gilardino, you know, uh, yeah. who was a great friend of mine and, and uh, you know, a great composer. So anyway, he's done, for example, some, some uh, wonderful work about uh, guitar, the history of the instrument, about technique, etc. And then, uh, you know, uh, like Gilbert Biberian, who you probably know, Gilbert, know. He's, he's written a book about uh, about uh, composing for guitar, things like that. I think these are, I think these are things that that should be done, things that are not I there, agree, yeah, in my opinion. I agree. You know, it, I it, think it seems a little bit yeah. maybe for a lot of people. Oh, why would you do that? But I think it's really important, and I mean, in that way, I, I know no one else. Um, that have done that more than you in the guitar world right now. So that is awesome. Well, I don't know. I mean, if no one has that. done, but uh, yeah. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this has been just, Dushan, this has been so awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, it's just very sure. nice. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. These things. And, <laughs> and thank you so much for doing this. Okay. Thanks, Johannes. It's great. Nice to be here. Nice to be here.